Good evening, parents. Welcome to our presentation this evening, What's Right with Local Schools. I changed the name halfway through, did you notice? Um, so tonight, uh, we have a few different sections to, to the evening. Uh, we'll begin with um, Nicola, who's going to do a little bit of an information session on the, the, the technical aspects, the mechanics of admission to both primary school and to secondary school. And we'll have a student sharing from Lara Hopkins. Then we have four parents, three parents plus Nicola, to, to give some parent sharing in the form of a discussion and then a chance for you to um, ask questions. And we aim to finish around 8.20. So thank you for coming. And uh, without further ado, let me introduce uh, Nicola Lewis. Good evening, everybody. Uh, nice to see you all and some familiar faces around as well. So we're going to start with some of the technical aspects, um, right back to the basics with um, primary school admissions. But before I do that, a bit about me. These are two of my three children, uh, the eldest one and the youngest, um, both attending a Hong Kong curriculum school. Uh, they're not always quite as angelic looking, so we did well to get that photo of them. So the types of school. In Hong Kong, there are many to choose from. This table's actually in your booklet. This is focusing on the schools that would fall under what we consider local. And by that, we're meaning those that offer the Hong Kong curriculum, not necessarily just Cantonese medium schools. So the government and the aided schools you can see at the top are those that you would apply to through primary one admissions, which we will go into in more detail um, slightly later. These are completely free to the parents and are completely funded by the government. The second category of school you'll see is direct subsidy skiing schools, commonly referred to in Hong Kong as DSS schools. Now, they are also offering the Hong Kong curriculum in secondary sex schools. Some of them may offer the IB diploma program, but less than 50% of their students will be sitting the IB diploma. The majority will be sitting the Hong Kong DSE examination. The fees for these schools are split and partially funded by the government and partially funded by parents. And the school fee uh, charged to a parent is regulated by the government. For those schools, and we will touch on this again later, uh, the application procedure is different in that you apply directly to the DSS schools. Uh, ESF schools will skip over this evening as they are not offering their local curriculum, they're offering a IB, especially a primary years program. We also have private schools in Hong Kong that offer a Hong Kong curriculum in a variety of languages. These are 100% funded by parents, and this is reflected by the tuition fee. Um, still quite a big range, and often more affordable than the international school options that we have. So when does it become important as parents to start making that decision? as to whether you are going to follow a more local or a more international track for your child's schooling. So this is the calendar for the 2017-2018 academic year, what all parents with young children are, are currently studying and preparing. You'll see one big fundamental difference in kindergarten and primary. And you'll see that the cutoff for <coughs> kindergarten is different in the Hong Kong system to the international systems that are available in Hong Kong. If you have a child two years old or younger, you need to pay attention to this. If you are studying in a local kindergarten, but plan on switching systems for primary school, you would be switching at the end of K2 and not completing K3. International schools do not have a K3 program. They would be in year one, of primary school at that point. That will also impact when you make your applications. So something to bear in mind. The same can be seen later on at the end of primary school with the transition into secondary. Children finish the local primary school system at the end of P6, but because of that offset kindergarten start finish time, international schools by that point are already into secondary with year seven. So again, if you are planning on going through a local primary school and making that transition, perhaps to an international school for secondary, 
you need to bear in mind that's going to be at the end of P5 and not at the end of P6. And you need to make your applications accordingly. So let's get into the nitty gritty of local schools. Um, we can cluster them together somewhat in how you can apply to them. So our private and direct subsidy scheme schools, you apply directly to the school. You can apply to as many of these schools as you would like. It is very competitive. These are the schools that you would have heard about requiring a portfolio. These are the schools that are going to require multiple interviews. Just bear in mind, that's the stressful part of those, the application process for those schools. You also have the government and aided schools for primary one admissions. And we will talk through how that POA system works. There is no need for a portfolio and there are no interviews. However, it is a bit more of a lottery as we'll explain shortly. So the primary one admissions. These are for the applications to the fully funded government schools and it is for eligible students. So who is an eligible student? The child must be aged five years and eight months. So again, this begins to highlight to you the difference in the ages of when primary school will start. At five years, eight months, most children would be in year one at an international school already. You must be a, a Hong Kong legal resident. That does not mean you need to be a permanent resident or hold a Hong Kong passport. Those that are in Hong Kong on dependent visas are also eligible. It may sound very obvious, but you cannot already be attending or have been allocated a place at a government funded school, whether that's a DSS or a, a fully funded school. And the reason that's in there, it may seem, of course, if you're already in primary one, why would you be <coughs> applying again? And the reason for that is for children born September to December, there can be a tiny element of choice as to which year group you place your child into. However, if your child is born in September and you have taken a primary one place at a government funded school and you don't like it, you cannot go back through the process again the following year to make them one of the oldest. You get one shot, so to speak. And again, you, you've not previously been allocated a place under primary one admissions for exactly the same reasons. You've gone through the process the year before with your September born child, the lottery results come out and you've been allocated your 15th choice school, you decide not to take it, repeat K3 and try again next year, that's not permissible under the, the POA system. You have to make your decision in advance. This links, uh, we, we again briefly, I, it's quite technical, but to go into it uh, in some detail with you now, <laughs> If you have attended a government school or a direct subsidy scheme school, you are not eligible to go through the primary one admission system again. So if you are in the process of applying for your P1 places and you are allocated a place, you win a place at a DSS primary school, and you think, yeah, I quite like that school. It's not my first choice school, but it's pretty good, and you take it, you will then no longer be allocated a primary school place through primary one admissions. Direct subsidy scheme school results come out much earlier than the primary one POA system. The POA is broken down into two parts, which we will also see, the discretionary and the central allocation. <coughs> but as soon as you take that DSS place, you are no longer part of primary one admissions. So primary one admissions, how does it work? Two stages, discretionary places and central allocation. You will be submitting your first round, your discretionary place application in uh, September of K3. And you will get, you can apply to a school anywhere in Hong Kong. We'll go through the details. Your results are in late November. If you get your choice of school, fantastic, you're done. And you can relax for the rest of the year. If you don't, you then go into central allocation the results of which are given in June, and school will start on the 1st of September. So that's where the stress begins to factor in with a going through the POA. The discretionary place system works that you can apply to one primary school anywhere in Hong Kong. 
does not matter where you live. And you will be awarded, or your child will be awarded points based on these criteria. The more points you have, as they say, points make prizes, and in this case it's a school place. To be guaranteed your choice of school, you would be looking at a minimum of 25 points no. to be safe. You can see from the categories that can be quite difficult for many. So the chances of you getting that school, especially if it's considered one of the prestigious local schools, at this round are quite slim. You then go into the central allocation. The central allocation has two parts to it. Just to confuse things further, part A is unrestricted. And by unrestricted, it means, again, you can apply to a school anywhere in Hong Kong, not based on where you live. Part B, is restricted and for those choices it must be schools that are within your net, your catchment area. This is what the form will look like. I apologize, the quality is not fantastic. But this is the form that you will be faced with for central allocation. Um, this is the first part, the unrestricted. You can have a maximum of three choices. Again, anywhere in Hong Kong. <laughs> And this is the second part, which scarily, it goes all the way up to 30. You can rank every single school in your net. Your net is determined by your residential address. So how do you maximize your chances through primary one admissions of getting your first choice school? The triple one approach. So the triple one approach is using the same school, your preferred school for your discretionary place choice, your unrestricted choice, and your restricted choice. Now that means that that school must be located within your net to be able to use it for that final part of central allocation. And that's perceived, the perceived wisdom of, of giving you the best chance possible. In theory, that would be how the whole of the POA would work. However, there is a hidden stage, the door knocking stage. This would only begin to be relevant after central allocation in June. So the results are out. All of the schools will hold a very small number of places. And we're talking one, two, depending on the size of the school, after central allocation. And these will go through the door knocking process. Realistically, your chances at this point, unless you have a contact inside the school of securing that school option, the chance of that door being opened is very, very slim and very stressful to leave it to this point. So unless you've got a guaranteed in with somebody at the school, you wouldn't be relying on, on this as a, a viable option. So that rounds out primary. Now I understand there are still um, people that are interested in secondary school place allocation. So we'll, we'll go through that as well. Um, again, how are you eligible? It's a tiny bit different to um, the primary school and who is eligible. Um, again, you must obviously be legally resident in Hong Kong. The participating, uh, the studying in a primary school that is participating in the SSPA, there is a way around this. So for anybody amongst us that may not be currently have a child studying at a qualifying school, you can apply for the forms directly from the EDB. Um, but usually, and again, you've not previously been allocated a place. Again, there are uh, two stages to the process, the discretionary place and the central allocation. One of the big differences here at secondary school is none of the results are allocated or released until much later. Um, you don't get them in June, you get them, uh, and you don't get them in November, apologies, you get them in June. So I, I'm not gonna stand here and read all of these to you now, but the discretionary place, again, a tiny bit different. Um, instead of one school, for primary, you can apply to two schools under this space, or for secondary school, again, there's no geographical restrictions, um, and you submit it directly to the school. This is where it varies a little bit, in that there is some sort of admissions criteria and weighting is given to applications. 
how they determine educational philosophy and characteristics of the student is fairly um, open for interpretation. They are allowed to interview, unlike in primary school, but there are to be no written assessments. If you would also then go through the central allocation procedure, Hong Kong is divided into 18 nets at this, this point. Um, Again, a, a difference to primary school is that your net is now determined by the primary school that you attend rather than your residential address. No, 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 it's okay, you can keep going. Um, so central allocation, um, again, broken down into two parts, much as it was before, an unrestricted choice, so again, a school anywhere in Hong Kong, choice of three. And this is where we get into the terms, and for those of you with older children, I'm sure you've heard the banding system in Hong Kong. So band one students and how would be allocated their places first. Now, how do you determine, or how are bands determined? The academic results in P5, the mid-year and end year of P5, and the uh, P6 results will be used and standardized across Hong Kong and the top third performing students would be placed into band one, and subsequently band two and band three. This is then reflected in the order in which they are given their preferred school places for secondary. So part B is restricted. Again, you can choose, um, but it must be with, from within the, the net in which your primary school um, falls. And again, the band one students are allocated their places If you've done some research into local schools, you'll know that we have some feeder and nominated schools, and this is where there is some sort of link between a primary school and a secondary school. Um, for um, feeder, if a primary school is a feeder for a secondary school, 85% of the places will go to those primary school students, and 15% will be for external candidates. Um, in contrast, if it's only a nominated school, then the percentage is much lower and it's only 25%. Again, which banding your child is placed into based on their academic performance becomes relevant because band one and band two students that are selecting the feeder or nominated school from their primary, so there has to be that link existing already, will be guaranteed a place at that school. We also have through train schools to complicate it further. <laughs> if you're in a through train school, you are absolutely eligible to stay for secondary. They do reserve 15% uh, for external candidates that would be applying through um, the discretionary place and central allocation. Now, if you are a student of a through train school and you decide that you want to see what else you can get, what else is on offer, you are able to join the process, but you then give up the right to have that place protected at your existing through train school. So a bit more of a lottery um, in approach. So yeah, just to sort of round out a little bit, and I appreciate there's quite a lot of heavy going material um, in terms of how applications, both primary and secondary local schools work, but we just wanted to give you a bit of an overview because it does vary so hugely from what you will be would expect from an international school system. So yeah, again, stage one, stage two, uh, discussion in place and central allocation. And so now, does anyone actually, before I invite Laura, has anybody got any questions on the technicalities of applying? Yeah, I'm not sure whether this is the technicalities, but I wondered what advice you have when you're looking at your school net, um, secondary or primary. Like how do you figure out what might, which school might be a good fit for your child? Much more difficult because some of them will have open days, some but not all. It's much harder to do your research, um, depending on where your net is. And if you're in a kindergarten within that net, connect with as many parents as possible because they're going to be one of your biggest resources. Um, the Facebook group for the Cantonese speaking families and schools is an excellent resource. Um, and you would get some open information from them. Turn up at the end of school and see the children coming out. 
And that will also tell you quite a lot about, about what goes on as well. It is much harder to research local schools, generally. What time did uh, you say that the banding kicks in? Is it it's for secondary. So at P5, P6, they will begin to look at their um, academic performance, and those test results are then standardised. And, um, and it's just academic performance. It's not let's look at your sporting prowess or your. It's only academic mm -hmm. performance. Yes, the EDB website, it breaks down and you can see exactly okay. its new residential address. Yeah. And also, let's say, eventually, we do grow with your school that you do want to apply to. When would you need to be in that, like, would you need to be in that catchment area by the time your child would be in P2, or? No, so the applications for POA are submitted in September of K3, by which point you would need to be within the net of your preferred school. <laughs> Again, if for, for any reason, if you weren't in a local primary school and you were arriving to Hong Kong, say, as a P3 student, then absolutely. But then it's where it has places. So sort of dormant things. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. Oh. There, there's no centralized system beyond P1. Yeah. Is it sensible to look then for what secondary school you want to go to and work backwards in terms of the net for that and the school for a feeding it and. and Yes, although part of your success at secondary school, the SSPA, is dependent on your child's academic performance. So yes, that would work very well, presuming if they are in band one or band two because of the way the places are allocated. But in theory, no. Okay, I can take more questions on this at the end as well when we do Q&A. <coughs> so Ed, now I'd like to have the opportunity to invite Lara Hopkins. Lara's got a great story. Um, in that she has studied in a local school and an international school in Hong Kong and at other schools overseas. So uh, please join me in welcoming Lara. <laughs> we would have some really valuable insight to add um, to the discussion that we're now going to have. And if I can also invite the other panelists to join us on that the stage, that would be great. Okay, if I could start by just asking each of you to introduce yourselves and the age of your children, and if you're happy to, where they're studying. Um, Lara, we'll miss over you. So, <laughs> Kate, did you want to yep, My name's Kate. We have a ten -year -old, nearly 10-year-old daughter. She started kindergarten in K1, did two and a half years in Chinese kindergarten, and has moved to Lei Si Yan School in Sai Kung, um, where she's now the Chinese stream of P4. So she's had about six years learning Chinese. Um, I'm Jean-Bierre Hilton. I've got two boys. One is 13 and one is 11. They're both studying in a DSS school. Um, it's an HKUGA system. And the older one is in the secondary school. The younger one is in P6 in the primary school. Thank you. Um, my name is Will. I've got three kids. Um, Olive, eight, Arthur, seven, and Oscar, three. Oscar, the youngest one, is in the Green Pastures Kindergarten in Tung Chung, which the older two also went through from K1 through K3. Um, and the older two are in uh, Wayland School in Discovery Bay. Okay, you've seen a picture of two of my children. I'm the mother of three children. My eldest is currently in P3. She's eight years old and she's at Kiangsu and Chekiang Primary School. My middle child is studied at the same kindergarten but left at the end of K2 to go to an ESF school. And my youngest is currently studying in K1 um, at Kiangsu and Chekiang Kindergarten. <coughs> so that's some background on all of us. So pretty diverse. And so I just started the discussion with why. Why did you choose to go down the local school route when you're in Hong Kong? And maybe if we start with, with Kate, uh, Kate or Will. And we'll um, I think 
I can't lie that money didn't have some <laughs> part into decision <laughs> process making. Um, but if you put money aside, I think once we visited the international kindergartens in Saiko, and there are some fabulous schools, there's no doubt about it, we felt that language teaching was really lacking. And for our daughter, who was nearly four, it seemed a real shame to miss the opportunity of learning Chinese um, from an early age where the brain's still nice and spongy and language acquisition is quite mm. straightforward for children. Um, so we looked at Lock Your Kindergarten and she started there two days later. It just, it's, it felt right. And they were a little bit wary at that point, not having had too many Western families come through the door and just kept telling us, your daughter's gonna learn Chinese, is that okay? And, and <laughs> absolutely, that's why we're here. Um, and so two and a half years later, she was fairly fluent, as you, much as a six-year-old can be, and has then gone on to primary school where she's in the Chinese stream, as I've mentioned. So her language skills are, at the, at the end of the day, it's about learning Chinese. And there are some difficulties, which I'm sure Lara has witnessed firsthand, and we've all, as parents, I think, come up against some challenges. But at the end of the day, Chinese language acquisition it has been our primary goal. Okay, thanks, Kay. Um, Will, did you want to add to that? I will get to you, Genevieve. It's just you've got older children. So <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, uh, Chinese language was the primary yeah. driver for sure, um, although obviously with the enjoyable financial benefits. Yeah. Uh, but mm. I grew up in Hong Kong um, through, and went through international schools. Um, in those days, it was a lot less common to go through or consider the local system um, China wasn't China as it is now, and people were on short-term contracts, not knowing how long they would stay. Um, it's okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, as it turns out, my parents stayed and have ended up retiring here, and, and I ended up, and both my sisters came back to live in Hong Kong. I studied French in primary school, French in German at university, and ended up moving back to Asia with, you know, the wrong languages essentially. <laughs> and I know, you know, my wife and I think we'll be in Hong Kong for the foreseeable future, and so I don't want to kind of miss out on the opportunity for the kids to speak their hometown language. I regret hugely not being able to speak Cantonese having grown up here. I can, you know, get around in taxis and things, but it's not the same as being able to speak it properly. And getting asked the question, oh, you grew up in Hong Kong, do you speak Cantonese? Not really. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> so I want to kind of give them the opportunity to get more into the local community than I was sort of at their age. Um, they're learning Mandarin um, as well, and I think being sort of native English speakers and fluent Cantonese speakers, Mandarin will be quite easy for them um, and just give them the opportunities to sort of do what they want in the future. That was the real, the driver behind it and so far, particularly on the language side, we're, we're happy with that choice. Thank you. Did you want to add anything to, or does that cover it for you as well, Genevieve? Two things, language and money. Money, yeah. <laughs> I think that's the same for, yeah. for everybody. Um, did you want to talk a little bit about, because actually your children are at DSS schools, mm -hmm. and how you felt going through that application process? Mm -hmm. Because it's somewhat different to the primary yeah. one um, system in um, terms of stress levels and, yeah. <laughs> and everything that goes with that. Well, I, I don't know. I had never came to a session like this when the kids were in, um, in kindergarten, so maybe I would have been more stressed if I'd actually <laughs> known more about it. <laughs> don't I, tell I, them that. <laughs> I, I went in like completely oblivious, saying, like, okay, I have to fill in this form for that school and that form for that school, so okay, I'll fill them in. And then uh, just I followed the process on the website um, of each school. Um, and then uh, one interesting thing about it is that when I even went in to hand in the form, um, and then when the interviews happened, I could all, that was a moment where I really got a sense of what the schools were like. Uh, so, for example, I applied for um, the St. Stephen's, Co St. Stephen's College, College. St. Pa no, St. Paul's College, one of them. I don't even remember anymore. It's the one he didn't go to. Um, <laughs> the other one. <laughs> yeah, the other one. And um, I walked in, and there's, there are kind of tables, and you have to hand in the forms and then uh, check off the boxes and go to this second table. And the person who greeted me looked at me, and I, and I actually speak a little bit of Cantonese, so I was like, okay, you know, I, I can talk, which <laughs> ran away, came back with the principal or something. Do you realize this is a Chinese school? <laughs> <laughs> totally different experience when I we went to HKUGA, where they ended up. Um, and uh, they just talked to us and uh, had the interview with the kid. It was, it was very friendly, and they, they never, it was totally straightforward. You know, they never. They never gave us the sense of this is something strange. Mm -hmm. They asked us, um, 
you know, how his Chinese was and did he want to conduct the interview in English or Chinese, but that was pretty so much So they it. were coming from a Cantonese medium kindergarten? Yeah, so the, uh, the older one actually started in uh, K1 uh, in a Cantonese medium kindergarten and the younger one started in, um, in pre-nursery, in N1 they call it, and we chose the kindergarten based on the um, long list of criteria which included, it was close to my office. <laughs> technical, technical, yeah, tec technical, the long choices, technical yeah. criteria, and that was pretty much it. Okay. Did you feel that the kindergartens that your children attended were good preparation for local prim uh, primary school? P1? It, it has been for us because I think a lot of your kids are feed a kindergarten into ACM, mm -hmm. so it's fairly seamless. They know the curriculum. You have done so many visits, there's joint activities between the schools. So for us, it was absolutely easy, seamless. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly the same for us. Um, Green Pastures. I don't know if it's an officially a feeder, but definitely has a link with Wales. Yeah, I think lots. I think of you're best. Students, yeah, I don't know exactly. It is feeder, but everyone goes there. Yeah, basically. So it's good. So they have friends in primary school that they also had in kindergarten, yeah. and the kindergarten and the primary school are um, geared up to deal with non-native speakers. So, for example, the homework in kindergarten, the instructions come back in English and Chinese, and so I rarely, but occasionally I help, can help with the homework, and my wife also, who does it more often than I do, can actually help with the homework. You can work out what they're supposed to do, which is good, whereas obviously as they get older and into primary, it becomes more difficult, and I'm sure that will come up at some point. But the, the kindergarten was a great preparation for the secondary school, and definitely they were linked. But I think the key, one of the key things was the... Uh, the number of non-native uh, speakers and the fact that they were specifically geared up for it. Do you think the number of non-native speakers perhaps had an impact on the amount of Chinese that your children were picking up? I would say yes for mine. Um, interestingly enough, when in kindergarten, when my the year that my younger kids started, it changed from a, I can't remember the previous category, to a an international kindergarten. And that meant that um, there was a bit more English used, and they they had glossier brochures, and they started charging more. <laughs> and um, and I I do feel that the it ended up that my older son, even though I started a year later, uh, just had a much better Cantonese foundation than the younger one. Um, and he they were these two, by the way, they were the only non-Chinese kids in the in the kindergarten, and also today with the. Um, I think the thing that really influenced the Chinese of my older son the most is there was a little girl who sat next to him in K1 who was the most talkative little thing you've ever met. And I feel like he went from you know zero to, to doing very well in a short amount of time because of her. And I don't want to talk too much about my personal experience, but would you say it's true that, <clears throat> now perhaps I'm a tiger mom, but when my youngest started K1 this year, I was the one that was in at the teacher on the 1st of September saying, do not sit my son next to anybody that speaks English in oh, the yeah, classroom. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They, they mm. lose the immersion if mm. they're allowed, because they're going to naturally speak to kids in their mother tongue. Yes. I mean, you can't stop that. Mm -hmm. So the more they're away from English speakers, the better it is. Mm -hmm. So for most of us, we've said it's a pretty seamless transition from kindergarten. You thought they were quite adequately prepared. Would you say that was also true academically? Yep. OK. I, you see, I, I perhaps um, I had, and then I did have a very different experience. And, and yet, and yet, um, I don't. Maybe my sons were prepared. I wasn't for primary. When we hit, when they hit primary mm -hmm. one, and I got that first sheaf of circulars, and the oh, on the oh first night, on the first <laughs> yeah, night, it's pretty rough. Isn't and it? <laughs> and then the homework started coming, and had a paragraph of small print, which was obviously intended for the parents to read. I don't know what the hell it said, and uh, there all the way back in the past and we didn't have this Google Translate like you kids have today. Um, and I didn't know, I literally didn't know what you were supposed to do with the homework. And he didn't either. I don't know. He hadn't been paying attention. It was like a big box. <laughs> so how did you, you overcome that? that challenge? Uh, tutors. Yeah. Tutors. We got the daily tutor for years. Okay. Is that common? We use, tutor, of reliance on tutors? we use a tutor when Sophia feels that she needs it either for a tricky dictation or without doubt for exam revision because we can't do the exam revision with her. So she has a fairly uh, fairly grueling couple of weeks leading up to exams, but she's happy with it. She, she's happy to do it. Yeah, yeah, very similar. Um, the, 
the step up from kindergarten to primary school for the kids is quite big mm. and I agree for the adult you know for the parents it's even more so because you lose those little helpful notes in English um, so yeah we've been we have a, a tutor as well which you know it's a homework club so a couple of the, mm. the non-Chinese kids will go together after school so it's school then homework club basically Monday to Friday and that's worked yeah for yeah, us yeah, yeah. academically I mean, after a while, my older son's Chinese got good enough that if the younger son didn't understand something, then the older son could help out. Yeah, exactly. Um, that, that's, that was a big transition. Have they responded to the amount of homework? Obviously, um, they're going to have friends that are perhaps in a different schooling system. And the as they get older and they become more aware, what have your experiences been in terms of... I think um, for us, homework is one of... School finishes home homework. There isn't much much else goes on in the evenings until homework's done. And that sounds probably a little bit extreme, but mm. some nights are heavy. There could be two hours um, homework to be done. Some nights she can do it in half an hour. So it really depends. Depends on the teachers. We've got a really vicious maths teacher this year, and she is just out there to get us with the homework. Pages and pages and pages. Last night was an hour and a half of maths homework, which I'm sorry is extreme. Um, but generally. We manage the homework, it's part of life, and it's what we do. Cool. How did you find the homework, Lara? Coming from overseas, where perhaps mm. you weren't in this culture of having an hour and a half of maths homework. Uh, yeah, it was definitely different. Mm. Um, I mean, the Chinese homework was insane. We yeah. had to write, uh, I first got to St. Margaret's, and they asked me to write an essay, and I'm like, what? Like, I just didn't, I didn't know any Chinese characters, and they just expected me to somehow write it. So Google Translate. The, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the, the Chinese homework, um, not so much the English homework, really, because I'm a native English speaker, so it was really easy. Was the volume me. high? Um, and did that impact on perhaps socially what you wanted to be doing? I mean, it was definitely more than what I've experienced before. Now that I'm a, like a senior, obviously, like comparing yeah. this to that is like that's nothing. Yeah. Like, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess the volume was more than I was used to, and it did impact me socially. I couldn't. Um, I my mother's very um, extra extra curriculum uh, invested. Like she wanted me to do ballet, horse riding, and I did mm. that, and I had to give up a lot of that because of the homework. Mm and the tests and the exams, yeah. Is that a common theme, that your children are perhaps having to give up? Yeah. I think it's a matter of being organised as well. I mean, if you, if you really get them organised, and there's a, uh, discipline's a strong word, but if your family is committed and organised, you can actually minimise. So the child has to start, well, I'll say the child. Sophia knows she's got five minutes to settle and get on with it, otherwise mm -hmm. I start getting cross. And lo and behold, it gets to my husband being cross because then you know, things do start going south quite quickly. But it, she knows that she's got an hour, an hour and a half, and then the time's hers. So it, to a certain degree, it's up to her, which I know is quite a bit of responsibility for a 10-year-old, but she's doing it. And you've got boys. People I, I with don't boys know. as well. Are different. I, I don't know. I, my <laughs> eldest is a girl, so I'm so just interested in that. I don't have any girls, so I don't have a basis for comparison. Um, but certainly with both of my boys, um, it is tough like hell to get them to sit down and do the goddamn mm. homework. And things which should be so easy, it's like one math problem. They just have to read the sentence and figure out the answer, and it can take 45 minutes, like, just to get them to do it. I mean, they're better now, they're older, but as, like, seven-year-olds, ugh, they're just When did miserable. that change? Just for my own personal <laughs> <way>. <laughs> um, When's that tipping point? Probably around P4. I'm almost P5. there. It, I mean, it was different for the two boys. Uh, like my, my 11 year old is now actually he loves math um, can read all the long word problems about mm. you know Siuman uh, having oranges and uh, you know Gaman having apples he's he's totally fine with it but it, it took oh, it was miserable for many years. Well, you've got boys. Uh, yeah, well, I've got girl, girl boy, boy boy and actually Olive um, finds it the hardest to get down and concentrate. When she does, she's very good and she's academically bright and quick and she got last year was kind of really improved massively during the course of the year. Both of the boys will just accept that they have to do it and get down and do it, which is really mm. unusual, mm. Uh, I would mm. have, I think. But um, with the extracurricular side and fitting things yeah. in, Olive does piano in the week, once a week. But other than that, it's kind of, um, you know, school and then homework club. But when they're at home in the evenings, it, they're free. 
and then at the weekends they're free. Mm -hmm. So home is kind of a nice, peaceful, calm, non-stressful time. Every now and again they'll have to finish off some homework or what have you, but it's kind of, you know, I, I like the fact that the homework for now is done outside. I think as they get older and they kind of want a bit more flexibility mm -hmm. on their time and they do different things, it'll be nice to have it back in. And Olive is, her Chinese is getting to the level where she needs less and less mm -hmm. help. help. Initially it's, yeah. oh, what, am I have to, what do I have to do? Then it's help with, you know, mm -hmm. doing it. And then it just gets into doing it yourself with, yeah. you know, minimal support. So the extra, funny, though, the, the, a lot of the homework repeats. So um, yeah. I remember my, when P1, he had this thing, we had to take pictures of things of different shapes and then paste them like triangles yeah. and circles and paste them onto the, um, and it took me forever to figure out what he had to do. Two years later, when the younger boy had the same homework. I said, yes. So don't throw anything out. Yes. Yeah. Right, so I'm making a mental note here just to <laughs> hold on to the homework. Yeah. Um, and the extracurricular activities, we think we're all moving them towards the weekend. Yeah. We, we do a fair amount after school, the school extracurricular activities. So that's yeah. an interesting point, because so I think that does vary hugely yeah. from school to school. She does, uh, she has four days a week at school. Yeah. And what sort of extracurricular activities can you expect at a local school? I th well, certainly for us, there's quite a variety, um, the sort of general tennis, football, things you'd expect, but there's some, or local, so taekwondo, dragon dancing, um, Chinese dance, so there's a few, there's, there's, we've got a really nice mixture and they're quite cheap as well. Yeah, likewise, I mean, yeah. you, you name it, robotics Art, and yeah. fencing and uh, soccer, whatever, there's all kinds of things. I'm feeling short-changed. We get origami, <laughs> <laughs> so we're not at the same <laughs> league. Yeah. Um, um, okay, yeah, that's interesting. So we've sort of touched on the academics and we could go into it in more detail. Socially, how have your children navigated primary school because kindergarten I think is one thing I think they're perhaps a tiny bit too young to be fully aware At primary school there are some friendships key friendships developing socially if the children made that those friendship connections mm. and um, developed yeah we, we're so in DB where we are it's kind of quite a tight community anyway mm. And so playing sport at the weekends or hanging out with neighbours, you know, the international school is right next door to the um, to Wayland, which is good and bad. When you're saying about the comparison, so we start starting to. When they're running, they're right having they're loads of fun, right? and yeah. I'm not allowed to run. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you yeah, know, it's kind of yeah. they're starting to make those sorts of connections. But um, so they have lots of friends outside of school, mm. but the ones inside. But when you sort of when we had a, a small birthday for Olive, when it was kind of invite a few friends, the majority were from uh, local school. Okay. Her kind of close friends are, um, you know, from the local school. Having said that, their parents are quite international. But her best friend at kindergarten, her parents were um, Cantonese, or no, um, Mandarin speaking and Japanese speaking. Okay. And so they were native English speakers at home. That's the and so she, language. yeah, so there are international kids within that local system. And she does tend to gravitate to those and maybe some of the kids who don't have um, such good English, but she does speak Cantonese with her Chinese friends. Very similar, Sai Kung's similar community. She's friends within school, everyone knows everyone in Sai Kung, very mm. similar. Yeah. So socially has your whole family sort of embraced the local school um, community in the fact that obviously as a parent with young children you'd often be quite heavily involved perhaps in the PTA of the schools. Um, obviously that's far harder with the language barriers so do you feel perhaps as a parent of a young child you haven't had the same yeah. experiences I, I, I found it tough to really get involved with the other parents I mean they they accept accepted me to a certain extent but um, you know because my Cantonese really isn't good enough to keep track like, like when it's a bunch of moms at a lunch and that and everyone is talking really fast I just can't keep up and that is definitely it's it's, um, it separates uh, for sure. Um, I don't think that translated to the kids though. They, they don't, um, I mean, you know, they know that they're not Chinese, but um, I don't think it's really effective. That, that's good because my daughter came home mm. in primary one in floods of tears and I was like, what's wrong? She's like, they told me I'm not Chinese. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes they are son, right. <laughs> when my son was really little, he, he shocked me by saying, telling me that he was English. I said, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he was just associating with language. And I said, well, wait, are you Chinese? He said, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Eventually he figured it out. But the, I mean, the thing is, they, um, 
although they both have tended to gravitate towards the better English speakers in their class for friends, um, it, you know, they all have been together since P1, so I don't feel like it's, they, they're not treated really as differently any more yeah. than anybody else's. They, they all, they have, you know, they're brothers and sisters, they all grew up together, so. Yeah. And that brings up one interesting part, and Lara mentioned this as well, in terms of English, mm -hmm. and the level of English that our children are being exposed to from being in a local school, are you happy with the English that the children are receiving at school? No. Nope. Would you like to expand, Kate? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's maybe a little bit harsh, but I think you have to remember that the English being taught in local schools is English as a second language for the local kids. So it's never going to be at the same level that we would expect, having grown up in our native countries, or you would, you would experience in international school. Once you've got over that hurdle, it's actually fine. And you just need to make sure that you're topping up with the reading, maybe some mm. bonds, books, and just do bits and pieces. Make a friend of your native English teacher within your school. Yeah. Um, they're, your, they, they're on your side. They'll, do, they'll take your child's side, certain, certainly ours does, and does a, a yearly test to make sure Sophia's um, hitting all the right mm. markers. Um, so there are plenty of things you can do without adding more homework. Mm. Um, and, but you do need to keep an eye on the English. Well, certainly, I, we do. Yeah, yeah, de yeah definitely. Um, I think Olive um, is very good. She's reading at the kind of the same level as her sort of age group in the international schools. Her writing's very good. Her handwriting and motor skills generally are excellent. Um, my mum, who is very it's like character yeah, talking. Yeah. No, it is. It is. It's one hundred percent. That's what it is. No, it's genetics because my kids can't. Oh, really? oh, maybe right. maybe this is the girl voice. <laughs> yeah. 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 Because. And so, you know, my mum is very impressed with Olive's handwriting compared to sort of other kids that age. And now she's finally, after six years, getting on board with our decision, which she didn't get over for a while initially. Um, but, uh, you know, Arthur, the boy, the oldest boy, he's in P1, um, his reading is, is behind and he needs, you know, he's needs a lot more help. So I think it'll catch up, and he's actually really happy now that his homework is written in Cantonese because he's better at reading and writing Chinese than English now. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Because his his English it was the opposite for Olive. Hmm. For for some reason, his brain responds really well to the graphics of the characters, hmm. whereas you read a book with him and he'll, you know, the repetitive ladybird type books where it's the same words on every page. He's looking at every one like he's never seen it before. Which drives me insane. <laughs> you know, it's a Chinese one. She's like, but, 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 you know, it's, it's just. It's, but for Olive, she's she's better at the English. Oh, interesting. Yeah. No, I mean, I I felt um, I just sort of I started out, I guess, getting over that hurdle. They aren't getting English class at school, is what I told myself. Mm -hmm. um, so somehow yeah. this is our responsibility. Yeah, it's telling story. It's telling bedtime stories in English. It's reading aloud in English. It's providing lots of English books. Um, watching TV in English. Um, and I think the result is that they actually, they're still better at English um, than they are chi at Chinese. So maybe I did too well on that part, I'm not sure. Um, oh, and that's good to, so especially as they move through into secondary school, are you, do you still feel you're able to meet their English needs at home? I think for younger children, I think so far our experience has been mm. yes, if yeah. we're reading to them the basics of that, but mm. I don't know if you could, for secondary school, I, how you're finding that? I'm, I feel it's okay. I mean, uh, keep in mind, um, HKUGA secondary school, it's, it's, it's English there's medium more medium. English yeah. than there was in primary mm. school. So I think uh, humanities is taught in English now, uh, as well as English class. Mm -hmm. And also um, science and math are taught in English. So it's only Chinese and Chinese history and like gym that are taught in Chinese anymore. Which is also leads to an interesting point when we've talked about subjects everything's being taught in, in Chinese. Mm. Actually, vocabulary in English for some of these other subjects, such as maths, mm. I know personally, I think, you know, my daughter was like, what's a triangular prism? I was like, what do you mean you don't know what it is? She's like, well, I know what it is in Chinese. I'm like, that's no help. Um, yeah. So it, how is that? And have you found that there's been big gaps, perhaps, in vocabulary in technical subjects? Because they, I feel like they get over it, it pretty fast. Yeah, they, they, just, they, just, they just sometimes just have to look a word up and yeah. oh, you mean that? And yeah, yeah, and hasn't been a big issue for us yet. So, sometimes I'll hear the younger one ask the older one, like, you know, oh Ken, how do you say, you know, whatever, in in, in mm. English, and then okay. and then the older one's like, you don't know. <laughs> so yeah. they, they get over it. They, it's fine. Just 
stepped a bit, I, you know, in the past year or so, there's been um, a lot in the press about the pressure that local schools place upon students um, and how that's panned out. Laura, how did you find your experience? Was it highly, highly pressurised in a, yeah, a local definitely. school? Yeah, um, definitely. The teacher felt the pressure. Yeah. 100%. Um, definitely more so than the international te uh, school teachers that mm. I'm there now. Like, they're much more understanding. They, um, they, um, so for example, at St. Margaret's, my local school, if, for example, you missed one homework, they would make you stand up for 15 minutes as a punishment and be like, <laughs> <laughs> like, they, they wouldn't, yeah, they, they wouldn't, um, they wouldn't mm. take any explanation whatsoever. And maybe that was just my school. Um, I don't know, but um, yeah, definitely. So if you if you mess up, there's no. It's just your fault, you know. Like that's there. They won't understand your situ like your situation. And do you think that impacted the learning environment inside the classroom? As in like stress -wise? as in yeah, well stress wise and actually how perhaps confident students would feel to ask a question if they didn't understand or or you weren't sure whether you were doing it correctly. Yeah. Um, from what I remember, yes, we had um, very strict teachers, and if you were to ask, like, what does that, like, can you re-explain that, they'd be like, are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> like they wouldn't, um, so yeah, lo lots of the girls that I was with, they, I, I guess you could say they were scared um, to ask for extra help, like, yeah. outside the class or during class. I could probably ask your dad, but I'll ask <laughs> you first. Do you think the role that your parents then for played at home was significant in how you managed within a local school system like, um, because I understand okay my, my child will come home and perhaps she scored 80 and I'm like that's great that's fantastic <laughs> whereas I know if her friends went home and said oh we've scored 80 they wouldn't be faced with quite the same response so do you think despite perhaps the classroom being quite stressful and quite pressurized that can be balanced out with perhaps the influences from at home yeah, um, both my parents are very chill. Like they, um, <laughs> yeah. that is sad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you passed. Um, yeah. They, um, if I if I was struggling in a subject, they would be like, okay, like let's sit down. My dad and my mom, they're so helpful with my work. They like when I <laughs> when I um, when I need to write an essay, they just like uh, um, they would help me with it. Like they would like I don't know. <laughs> I, will, I will say though. That, um, got two younger girls in primary mm -hmm. and I remember my primary years in England being pretty carefree and mm. I didn't really have anything remotely like academic stress mm. until I was 11 mm. and I started at secondary school and the idea of being stressed that I hadn't done my homework or there was a test coming up mm. that just didn't figure in my life at mm. all and if, if you have any pangs of guilt about you know how you treat your you know children under ten, you mm. want them to have this you know thinking in Chinese, thinking in English experience, which without question expands your brain. You are a little bit in German, and mm. probably by the time she landed in Hong Kong, it was a bit more difficult to think about repeating mm. the exercise. Yeah. But what she did in German was incredible. I mean, literally, her and her sister would turn to German to argue. <laughs> and, and, and that that ability to think in two dimensions is mm. enormously beneficial when it comes to many things later. But in Hong Kong, if you go down that path, you just have to swallow oh, that yeah. your life as a young child I, yeah. is a bit tougher. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But if they don't know any different, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's much easier to start straight um, off the bat yeah. in. Uh, in the local system rather than switching so mm. if you know if, if you come into p1 and haven't done the kindergarten which some people That'd have then that's tough. yeah you can get through it but that's way worse than mm. three kind of gentle years uh, leading in or even two i mean olive um joined k1 in uh, the second term because we were talking mm. about um you know learning the language, having a good, we said, look, it's only going to happen one way is if she goes into the local mm -hmm. system. And so her first time, she had sort of two. She joined in the second and had uh, English uh, kindergarten, uh, you know, three mornings a week, and then the Chinese one in the afternoon, five days a week, and then we dropped the English one when the, the Chinese one seemed mm -hmm. to be working. But I think going in later would be really tough. Mm -hmm. 
But I, I do think the level of stress, it does have a lot to do with the parents' pressure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know, I feel more pressure than they do for some reason. When they bring yeah. the handbook of shame with the, the <laughs> non submitted <laughs> homeworks. Um, you know, I'm the Being one who's... told off by your children <laughs> for not signing stuff. Yes, yes, yes. and the, and the right. parents have been circled online. Like, and oh. if you miss yeah. four yeah. homeworks in a month, you get the official letter. Demerit. Yeah. Yeah. And meanwhile, the kids don't sit there like, oh yeah, I missed my homework. Like, what? what do you mean you missed your homework? They don't seem to. I don't know, they don't get stressed about, stressed about it somehow, whereas, uh, I don't know, I feel like I'm more stressed than they are, and, and um, so somehow it, it's not, uh, I don't know, either, either the, I don't give them enough pressure or I'm giving them wrong kind of pressure, but they don't seem to get stressed about it. So this may not be applicable, but if we're saying there is that pressure and that stress in the classroom, is it having an impact on the whole family at home and the relationships? between parent and child as well. We have nights which are stressful, but mm. I'd say that's, isn't that the same in any family? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think as kids progress in international school through into the IB years, there's a lot of homework. You know, mm. it's, not, it's not only local school that provides homework. Yeah. I mean, my sister-in-law Lou's here and her, both her kids are in Harrow, and Sundays is spent doing homework. Mm -hmm. So it's not, homework isn't just for us, it, you know, it does go across other school, the other school systems and I think sometimes we, we just get labelled with well you're the homework school um, but it you know it, it has its high moments and its low moments for sure yeah I think it needs there's just a lot more logistics involved in the local system when we talk to you know, friends of ours with kids and you know, they have kind of more hands on and having to do things and maybe you know go in and outfits yeah. and make that yeah. sort of projects. so they have logistics projects. as well yeah. projects right you know we just have yeah, homework. fill this, do this, you know, in, in advance, and, mm. and um, Olive doesn't really mind, and there's a bit of scatterbrained Arthur, who's a real pleaser, gets really frustrated when we don't, uh, mm. you know, when he's the odd one out in his class because we haven't done something, he comes home and he tells us, you know, and sometimes that we need to step up. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, this, it's more the comparison with their peers for some obvious thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's probably when the stress comes, if they're the only one who hasn't, whatever, who has the wrong kind of backpack. No, no, exactly, and I think actually one of the things which is one of the downsides of the local system for us is the kids will point that out. They do like to conform, and they will, you know, they will yeah. kind of tell on each other more and say, you know, they'll be talking in the class, and then one of our friends will say, "Miss, she's talking," you know, and you yeah, there's sort of that things like that. Nature, isn't there? Yeah, which yeah, you don't. Yeah. You, you mm. sometimes you should. You, you feel like they're not as much as a unit as the kind of a gang would be in, or the, a group of friends would be in a, an international school, but. You know, it's, it's small things that you notice like that, but nothing that so far at least have made us, you know, regret the decision. Mm. But there are, you know, unique challenges. But they, they get it eventually. I, I mean, last, um, last Halloween, actually October 30th at 9 p.m., my older son told me, oh, I have to have a co Halloween costume for tomorrow. <laughs> and then he told me what he had prepared. Oh. And I thought, oh my God, the, you know, the things, you know, things have changed. Change. And this, mm -hmm. I, I think somehow having that preparation, you know, the, the years of, yes, you had to do all these things, sooner or later it does rub off and then the kid is able to do it by himself after yeah. a while. Probably a question given the ages of your children, the transition to international schools and has it crossed your radar? Yeah. If so, have you got any sorts of time in mind and why? I haven't won the Mark VI yet, so. <laughs> <laughs> but we're, co we're, con we're considering options for secondary, which may or may not include international schools. Okay, so yeah. it's sort of all the way through primary, you've been, you can see it yeah. working for you, yeah. and that might be. But we're looking at um, various options, um, but as that chart points out so clearly, you've got the whole P5. Yeah. Year six mm -hmm. thing going on. Have I got that right? P5 yeah. So at the end of P five, yeah, the end of yeah. So that's actually only twelve months away for us. So mm. it's oh. suddenly all quite scary. Yeah. Well, what do you yeah, see I on mean, the horizon? The plan, um, you know, has always been uh, primary, um, local, and then secondary international. Um, unless you know, in P five and P six, when they start getting into the bands, because we don't particularly care what band they might end up definitely. in. But the school definitely starts driving you mm. towards, and our, the, the school we had while being friendly and nice is also quite academic in the sense of, mm. you know, they want good grades and they... Mm. To play um, some Yeah, so to they're gonna go through this sort of unnecessary 
stress that doesn't really affect them, and even they won't be immune from that. So we're thinking that if, if so maybe take them out, you know, for the maybe P6 international, so they can have a year of sort of international education before making the jump. So we're sort of still talking about options. We don't have a firm idea. Um, I think if they can, um, if they're still happy, that's the other thing as well. Is mm. you know, while they're happy, I'm happy, and so far they're all happy. Um, so we've talked about it, and the timing is it's, it's up in the air. But you know, looking at other sort of, I think it's the DSS schools. The DSS schools are really interesting. Yeah. Mm. So looking at so other friends of ours who've you know gone to fee paying kind of half local, half international. It yeah. seems like so we're now there's a lot more schools in our thought process than they were when they were sticking them in K1 and hadn't done much forward planning. So. Just one question, with the banding, are you told what your, which band your child is in? Did the school tell you? I don't know. Wow. They, they didn't, well, I mean, our, yeah, our school, I, their schools are through trains, it's, so, yeah. it's so they didn't tell us. It's very obvious by which <laughs> secondary school you place into, because the schools that academically so is very it well the child who's banded or is it the, the school? Child, it is the child. The child's not banded, the but then the child's gone, choice of secondary yeah, school yeah. tends to the be... So all yeah. of the band one students end up mm. preferring one secondary school, mm. which mm. then is linked with being academically mm. sound. Yes. Yeah. Mm. So definitely, unofficially, you can, you can see that, mm. that correlation. I didn't know that. I thought it was the schools that were banded. Well, they've, they've well, said the bad schools aren't banned anymore. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's officially, not officially. Well, we so know, not officially. <laughs> yeah, right. If that, 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 that everything else has only banned one yeah. student, then it's yeah. called God, banned one school. school informally. Yeah, informally. Yeah. 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 But I mean, the, the, uh, I have to say, though, we wouldn't consider, or we're not considering international school partially because we think the secondary school that um, my older son is in is really good. And, uh, you know, I think the teachers are fantastic. Um, and they, you know, they're really involved and, you know, there's extracurricular, there's whole learning, there's, you know, sort of, you know, whole student development, there's all kinds of things. I, I feel like it's, it's really a, it's really a hot, you know, hot top-notch school um, and happens to be a local school, so great. Laura, how is the Hong Kong DSE and how do you feel that sort of <laughs> compares to your experience? Now that you're and the in an IB, IB. Yeah. yeah, that learning. Way because I think to... for a lot of parents that are perhaps, yes, we're committed to local kindergarten, yes, we're committed to local primary schools, that the big sticking point for many families past that is do they want their child to graduate with the HKDSE mm. or not? Um, and so, if you, to, if you have any insight into mm -hmm. similarities and differences, because right. you've studied under both. Mm -hmm. Um, so if I could um, put it down to one sentence, mm -hmm. um, DSE is more content and MYP or IB is more um, projects, assignments, mm -hmm. homework. Um, they really, the last two years in local school um, that I was in, they like just pound you with like content, like just work. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess, yeah, that's really the big difference. Was it a difficult transition to make <laughs> in terms of your mindset and how you work and, and your yeah. ability to complete perhaps what's a fairly open-ended task, mm -hmm. whereas at definitely at local schools, it's very, very confined that this is what you will be completing? Yeah. Um, so when I first um, transitioned to St. Margaret's to Hong Kong Academy, a lot of teachers um, in the parent meetings, they would tell my parents that I'm not getting, uh, I'm not asking enough questions. And I'm not um, inter. I'm not being as interactive as I should be because really, I we that that w didn't exist. Mm. I never had. I never asked questions mm. outside of class or in class to the teachers really, and not many people did that. But that was like a huge part of it, like the not ask asking. How long do you think it took you? Do you think six months, and you felt more comfortable and more aware of what was expected, or you think it took longer than that? Um, I feel like it was at the end of grade 11, and I got there at two months in grade 11, so I guess six okay, months. Six seven yeah. months. Yeah. Yeah, six months is when I really like got a hold of mm. myself, and I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> this is how you do stuff, like, okay. like organizing. Okay, I think your insights have been fascinating now. I'm sure what <coughs> most of you would like to do is be able to ask your questions, so if that's okay with everybody, we'll open it up for Q&A, and feel free to ask any of us 
any question that you'd like and we'll try our very best to answer it from a parent's perspective. Does anybody have anything they'd like to ask? from my point of view, I, um, I, I worry about it, but I also I have trouble because I don't have anything to compare it to. I've never lived my alternate life in an alternate universe where I sent them to an international school. Um, but to a certain extent, I feel like the same demands are being made of my mm -hmm. friends who have their kids in international school. Maybe they're somewhat different um, style of demands, but like, you know, they have to bake cookies and they have to sell tickets and they have to make the costume for the school play. And, Okay, maybe I have to hire a tutor, but um, you know, somehow there's a, a lot of time involved, and I have to fill out the stack of circulars this big. But I, I think they do too. I've got a child in a ESF IB primary school, in addition to my daughter who's P3 in a local school. There's a lot to be said for homework that's very, very straightforward, and a handbook that tells me exactly what I need to do, because the the opposite of that in the international school with an IB program, I ask my six-year-old, so what are we working on? Blank face comes down, it's like, right? And so then it's a lot more digging, it's a lot less obvious. And so often, I feel that I probably do more of a disservice in terms of home support to my internationally schooled son than I do to my local school daughter. Interesting. The other, the other thing kind of links to the language as well. It kind of, it does ramp up the homework, but you saw it's kind of like boiling frog. You don't notice it so much because <laughs> first day of, of K1, when your kid is three, homework comes back, right? That might be coloring in a frog mm. or putting a sticker on something or tracing a line of a window, which yeah. is the start of the motor skills. Yes. So it's not homework as in, you know, lines, but it's it starts you off early with maybe five minutes of homework on day one. And then, mm -hmm. you know, by P3, you might have two hours, yeah. but you kind of, you're not thrown in straight at the deep end. So you kind of, you know, it's not perfect and there are definitely, despite tutors, Sunday night, mm -hmm. what do you mean you've not done your homework? <laughs> <laughs> there are those moments, but it's, it's kind of, you, you, it builds up. Does anybody else breathe a really big sigh of relief when they finish their exams in June? Yeah. And you know that you're free until September. I yeah, always feel this huge... Holiday homework. <laughs> but we do that. We do that really early. We just tick that off and get it done. That's this is the, my thing with holiday home. If only they could just do it yeah. in the first two weeks and get yeah. it done. But there's always oh, keep a diary of your summer vacation yeah, and yeah. write a book every day and mark down the date that you That's did it. That's far too international. And it's never. Yeah. You can and never get yeah. rid of it. You're, yeah. You can never be like now I'm free. It just it, it never happens. And there's always like the night before school, did you finish all the holiday homework? Mm -hmm. There's always one thing. Same with ours, mm. I guess. Anybody else? Yeah. Hi. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, I should say that we have a daughter in school, so we're school mm. school, Haiku Primary School, which, oh, yeah. we, which we chose because I called around a whole bunch of schools and tried to get a feeling of how, how stressful or how unstressful they were, and we chose this one and discovered it wasn't that unstressful, but <laughs> probably better than some of the others. But my question is um, specifically about math homework. Do you guys feel like the math is taught at a too, sometimes a too high level? Because that's kind of the, our problem of recently. English is fine. She loves Chinese. But the math is like three different three-digit numbers that they have to all add up and stuff like that. And it's, it's like that's a bit harder to kind of help with. If, and then we feel that they, they teach a bit too fast. It's probably school dependent, wouldn't you say? Well, same curriculum, but well, as I say, I, I, I know those sums. I can literally see it in my, in my <laughs> yeah. right, right there, and, and you know, sometimes you know, helping out with the maths homework, you think, right, how do you do that again? It's sort of really old school. Um, but with 
they, they've been okay with the, the problems so far. Luckily, they like maths, which is good. I think you know we would have had a disaster if they didn't, because it is it does go fast. Yeah. The first maths exam that Olive did in the first term of P1, she scored really low because she didn't understand the questions. Because exactly. they're not reading yeah. them out in P1. Uh, this was no. This was a written, the written maths exam. But did they still yeah. not write? Read the, the teacher no, they, read the questions. Was, that's right. They, they no. Oh, so we the had the P one and P two. They was, had the teacher read the questions. Yeah, it was, it was, oh, Seoman has yeah. how many butterflies, and yeah. Gaman has how many um, you know yeah, crickets, really and then tough. they get distracted by the butterflies and the cricket <laughs> character. And they don't, yeah, they don't pay attention to the numbers. But it got better when she understood it. So there was one where there were four sums, and you had to the right answer was which two add up to eleven, and mm -hmm. she circled the two that didn't. So she sort of, the maths was right, answering the wrong kind of yeah, question. Yeah. So maths was tricky, but the language played a, a big part in it, but the, and it is faster. Oh, yeah, and I think it overstretches because, and it's perhaps the way local school teachers across all subjects, if your child struggles and misses picking up that key piece of knowledge, stay on the, train, yeah. the train's already gone, and then there's no going back, or definitely within the school, and then I think mm. the... It, the responsibility falls back to the parents quite quickly mm -hmm. to identify okay so you didn't quite understand how to do long multiplication and therefore the school aren't going to spend that time investing mm -hmm. in getting you there so we need to um, mm -hmm. and I would say that that works in maths but it's also true across mm -hmm. any of the other well, subjects. I would say one thing about math it was just a tiny comment that my older son's secondary school math teacher said uh, he was talking about whether my son should be in this group or that group and he said but you know, <laughs> Hong Kong's pretty good at math. And the point was that, yes, uh, whatever, even if my son was going to be in the lowest math it's group, still pretty good. compared to the rest of these, you know, schlubs around the region, we're fine. So I, I think it could be true that, yeah, Hong Kong math is more advanced than elsewhere. Yeah. On that basis of that one sideline comment. Um, I'm just curious to know what your kind of lowest point was. Because um, if I'm brutally honest, there's been points where if we'd had another option, would have pulled her out and put her in another mm. school, but obviously in Hong Kong, it's very difficult to find other options quickly, mm. given waiting lists and tuition fees. I just wondering, like, if you are doubting yourself and your commitment to the local school system, mm. what would you say? What would your advice be, like, on whether you should persist? I well, I didn't persist with one of my children. Mm. <laughs> Being brutally honest, I'm a very big advocate for local schools. I think there's a lot to be said for it. I think. If you're in a position where there are alternatives, for some children the alternatives perhaps are better, and we made that decision for our middle child. Um, in terms of our darkest moment um, for my daughter who's now in P3, it was probably that first night in P1, where she came home with this mound of homework, a handbook written in Chinese, and a load of letters that I needed to complete also in Chinese, and I just thought there is no way we are going to get through this. Mm. Um, and it took probably until P2 for us to, and had experienced everything once, so it wasn't quite such a nasty shock when those things came home. But that, that was my darkest moment, I don't... <laughs> yeah, we are for, again, Olive, when she went through kindergarten, I think just being very chatty and outgoing, you know, kids don't like to, it's probably the same in international school, they don't like to tell you what they're learning or kind of show off and you want to kind of constantly yeah. asking them for information which they refuse yeah. to give you constantly. But by the end of it we could hear Olive speaking Chinese with some of her friends like, oh wow, Olive can actually speak Chinese because we had no idea that she could apart from a few homeworky things. And, um, and so we're like, that was good and she was okay in P1. Arthur, for three years in kindergarten, would just sit there and go, I don't speak Chinese, I'm English. <laughs> <laughs> and someone would chat to him on the bus and he would look at them with a blank face and he goes, I don't speak Chinese. <laughs> and I'm like, Ugh. And it was kind of okay in, Q, in, in kindergarten, I'm thinking P1 is going to kill this child. <laughs> and I was terrified of that transition. And uh, he's been fine. He was either just picked a lot up in a short period of time or was just a good liar for three years or <laughs> but it wasn't a kind of a one horrible moment but I did have three years of mild low level stress that Olive could cut it and he couldn't because they're very different kids he's much more shy and introverted um, but actually he's the one that's really diligent with his homework and he's doing really well and he's mm -hmm. tells us things about the Chinese language 
because he has to, he thinks about things a lot and then gets it and is really interested in it. Olive is just bright and picks it up and doesn't care. Tick the box, go. You know. So it's, it's, it's really interesting. But I was really terrified and it turned out okay. The third one, who knows, he's a maniac. <laughs> <laughs> That's the child syndrome, yeah. I think. <laughs> Mm. Um, so we, we had actually a low moment, maybe it's yet to come, we had a low moment, my second um, son, uh, when I was talking to his GS teacher, it's general studies by the way, for, that's you know, like history plus science, so talking to his GS teacher around the end of P4, maybe it was midterm, and I got the feeling that he'd gone through that entire general studies class, he was supposed to be taking notes, he was supposed to be studying from the notes, and like that he hadn't gotten a thing, like he didn't even know what subject they were studying. Um, <laughs> And in P, uh, P5, P6, he's gotten better. He, he can complete the projects by himself now and you know, writing his, his sort of content plan and so forth. He seems to be okay, but there was a while I thought, did, do you even have any idea what you were supposed to do in class? And I, I, I couldn't say yes, I didn't know. Laura, what was but your lowest point in a local school? My lowest point? Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I it's, it's too painful. <laughs> no, I yeah, don't. yeah. I don't want to give you. <laughs> no. um, I guess um, at the beginning of um, Form Six, when it was our final year, um, the stress got way, way too much for me. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, at one point, I didn't even want to go to school, mm. and it, it was really difficult. And mm. I said to my mom, "I need to get out. It's just, it's too mm. much because my exams would be in." like in May and Mm -hmm. I only have this amount of time to learn all of that like it just Mm -hmm. and like the the fact that um, the teach again this is just my school I don't know about other international uh, in local schools but they wouldn't um, they wouldn't go out of their way to help you like if they would only help you if it like I mean they they weren't great teachers I think but again that's just my school I don't know about anyone else Um, but yeah it was my lowest point was at the beginning of form six and mm. that's when I left. Yeah. No. So, <laughs> yeah. Mm. I'm not sure we've given you much hope. <laughs> <laughs> no, no child, no real low points. So. <laughs> I'll tell you another thing, though. My older son, um, there was a while where he also kind of refused to admit that he'd ever heard a word in Chinese or had ever seen a Chinese character. But he's over time, he's actually developed now, he's proud of it. And uh, he likes to put me to shame and mm. say, like, oh, mommy, you don't understand the notice that our building management has put up. Let me tell. Let me explain it for you. Um, and so, I mean, it's it's definitely it's shifted a lot. So, like this low point is not necessarily forever, right? It's 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 a point. There's a there's a trough, but then goes up again. more the choice of curriculum, isn't it? Yeah, uh, for some of those Style DSS too, schools, yeah. they will offer IB diploma at 18, but as I said earlier, it wouldn't be for the majority. The majority still need to sit the Hong Kong DSC, but there is that option in there. Um, some of them are English <coughs> medium, although still you, there are English, in. yeah, and there are English medium schools that are through primary or the um, fully government funded schools as well. Depends what you're looking for. Um, within the school, um, in the same way that with any international school, um, different schools have different, um, completely different fields, and we're all from different mm. local schools, and I'm sat here thinking like, oh wow, I wish I could have a bit of this and a bit of that, because my yeah. school is different. Mm-hmm. Um, so the same would be true. Um, each school is, is different, and therefore what you rate as, as important or preferable is gonna be relative to your, your own child. Does it cost a lot to have home tutors? Much. You don't need extensive tutoring. I, um, we, my first tutor, I paid him uh, 70 Hong Kong dollars an hour, um, which was super cheap, and uh, apparently I'm a sweatshop. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think from then we've been tending to pay about 100, 100 something per hour. Uni- university yeah. students, yes. no, mm. university students are, are always keen yeah. Um, yeah. to earn 100 bucks an hour. And you know, this is not, they're not having to teach something very high. They have to teach you know, whatever primary, primary to yeah. math. I think yeah. they can handle it. Yeah, university students is a, a good tip to take away for everybody, um, mm-hmm. for, especially for kindergarten and primary school. Although, can I add that we have tried, we have a good tutor right now, but we tried to find some backups so they 
No, they, they play cards. Like, they play cards. Mm, like one girl, yeah. like she's like supposed to come yeah. ten ten minutes before she sends a message saying, "Can't yeah. make it." Never answers her WhatsApp messages anymore. Well, I'm, I'm good friends with the um, person at uh, EC Tutor who just supplies me with new tutors whenever the last one flakes out. <laughs> I think the longest we had one last was maybe a year and a half. But, I mean, that's okay. That's it's. Yeah, it's a sweatshop, so of course there's turnover. Yeah. I'll, I'll go to a sort of club or class, so there's kind of a few people that they know, and it's kind of more like prep in like a public school or a private school in the UK rather than, um, you know, a home, a home tutor. Because we, we get, we, on DB, it's just within the community, it's hard to find sometimes. But if you go to like a dedicated place, there's other kids center. that they know, mm -hmm. it's just they go in and they do their work supervised. And it, it's worked for us. And yeah, it's, it's not that expensive. It's certainly cheaper than the international schools. Those. If we'd been able to find one of those, I would have sent the kids to those. But oh, we, yeah, just, no, we yeah. don't have that tight community. I didn't yeah. even know where to start to look. Yeah. We'd be certainly looking at DSS before international, but I think that the Chinese language skills are probably more in tune with what DSS is more where we want to be than international anyway. And it's more affordable DSS. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there's also international and then like fancy, expensive international. There's there's a range. Yeah. Yeah. We we were initially, you know, thinking, you know, we're talking, you know, seven eight years away, nine years, ten years, planning, thinking, all right, well, it'll be fine when we get there. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> gets better. <laughs> but um, yeah. now that we're kind of more aware of the other options that are sort of, yeah, mm -hmm. kind of yeah. half international, half local, or just more affordable international schools, you know, the automatic thinking, you know, even before I had kids, you know, local, then ESF, there's actually a lot more options yeah. now. I'm going to give one more example, by the way, which is an interesting one. My husband, actually, he was born in Taiwan, and then he grew up, I think, until he finished P4 in Beijing. And um, it was all in local schools then. So it was years ago, but it was all in local schools. He doesn't speak a word of Chinese now. Yeah, not Mandarin, not, not Puhonghua, not anything. Um, I mean, he, he could probably learn it faster if he started from scratch now, but, but basically uh, I feel like he didn't stay in that local system quite long, long enough, enough to cement the language skill. And so that's one of the things that if I, would to ta I would take out the kids right. now, I feel, still feel like it would be too early. I'd want to keep them in, at mm. least until kind of past puberty, and <laughs> only then, uh, you know, let them let them slack off. Yeah. When your children first started in the local schools, what was the Cantonese and Mandarin language proficiency? Had they had lessons before, or were they starting school on day one without a word of the local language? Day one zero. Day one zero. Yep. And zero. How, how how did she cope like from day one? She was, uh, I mean, she was a little bit, what, 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 what are you doing to me? I mean, there was definitely a look of disbelief that I was just kind of leaving her. Um, but within a couple of weeks, she was doing the Joe Sands and the, you know, joining in the morning rituals. A few weeks later, she could count to 10. Uh, end of K K1, she had a, probably a vocab of 50 characters, maybe. And it just grew. Spongy brain, language acquisition was easy. Yeah, yeah, I, I'd agree. I think yeah. we started we started one year earlier because we started at pre nursery, so age two, but with very little Chinese exposure beforehand. We tried, we we <coughs> tried beforehand with some play groups and some other things, mm -hmm. but definitely nothing that was going to prepare them for yeah. for, for what was You're coming next. Started in K one, PN, so pre nursery, PN. so yeah, yeah, one year before, mm -hmm. so two. Years old. And I, I remember when my, my older one, he started in K1, mm -hmm. and so he hadn't really had any exposure before that. Um, and he told me at some point, as we were like on the way to school, Mommy, don't like a new school. And uh, it was so sad, but then that was like a week in, and then I think after two weeks, it's fine, mm -hmm. he didn't care. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned pre nursery. Yeah. Do you all find it useful or yeah. can do it or don't have to? We, we didn't. I don't know, because that was when we were still thinking about how we, what, what we were going to do. I guess we did it because our preferred primary school had a kindergarten which had a pre-nursery program. So therefore, it made sense to us. We were both 
working, so to have them go somewhere and hear something and play with other children, we figured it, it may as well be in, in, in our case, Putonghua, um, rather than English. Mm -hmm. and, and that was one of the big drivers. So a higher chance of the K1 place that we wanted, some social interaction because they weren't getting it at home, and some language. Just gets them out of the house, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Basically. <laughs> at two. They're not learning yeah. anything. Yeah, ours went to sort of Western nurseries and the kids kind of w went through the same ones and, you know, with friends of ours who had kids of the same age, so they had their sort of, their one year of fun. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm trying to understand the difference between a government-aided school, a DSS school, and a local private school, apart from the fees. They're all Hong Kong curriculum. Um, major difference is funding, obviously. Private, fully parent-funded, DSS, partially parent, partially government, and then the government-aided schools are fully government-funded. Um, so that is the major difference. Now, within each of those categories, you will find schools that are English medium of instruction or Cantonese medium of instruction, the majority being this one, and there are some that are Putonghua medium. So does that necessarily translate to better facilities, better methods of teaching at a school where you're paying a little more fee? Well, let's talk. We've got we've got a DSS yeah. parent. Would you say that um, paying more actually? I mean, we're we're paying more than say Taiku Primary School. Um, I mean, that, that was that was the uh, my second son uh, originally didn't get into HKUGA, and so he was going to enter Taiku Primary School, which is much cheaper. I felt like the facilities of the two schools, like the physical facilities, were almost exactly the same. Um, the the teachers, I, I only had preliminary contact with them, but they seemed quite similar. So um, I think it's more the individual school, like what's the philosophy, the educational philosophy of, the, of that school, um, you know, how do they recruit their teachers, how do they teach them how to teach. I think that's more important than yeah. which category it's in. Yeah, uh, my child's at a private local school and the facilities are definitely nothing to write home about <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, it's, it's, it's horses for courses for the mm -hmm. kids as well. Um, Olive's uh, best friend left uh, Waylon after P1 and moved to a different local school and was much happier there for her particular mm. kind of personality and learning style. But Waylon is quite academic. Another one was a bit more, it's not the right word, but kind of Western in, in, in its mm. mindset and that suited her, whereas Olive was still happy and, and kind of stayed. But I do think, mm. you, you know, even within each of the types of school, yeah. there are, you know, your kids are going to be happier or, you know, more or less happy. Uh, if it's a newer school, the building's like to be likely to be nicer. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that, that's you know age of the building. If it's forty years old, it's crumbling already. <clears throat> Yeah, it, it, it depends on the it depends on 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 the kid as well. I guess what you do at home. So at school, there's a test, there's a right and a wrong answer. And even if so, in an English uh, comprehension or a question, if you you know, the cat was sitting on the mat and the answer was the cat sat on the mat, you get that wrong. Well, you know, even though it's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's there's <laughs> yeah. So sometimes you have to explain yeah. to your kid that. Yeah, technically you're right, but this is yeah. the, you know, so there's, there's very much a, you know, there's a right answer, and then there's do it again until it's the right answer, and, <laughs> and, and that is kind of teaching to the test, but then the kids who are naturally curious and, and whatever else, that will all still come through, so, you know, but a lot of you, that kind of comes out at outside and after school. Mm. But I felt like, you know, people talk about like, oh, Hong Kong kids aren't creative, the schooling system is this, that, and the other. I felt like I've never seen this. I, I don't see, and even the classmates, they, they're totally curious. Um, I, I, don't, I feel like the people, when they say that, they're talking about maybe the previous generation. Um, I think that now, even the local, local schools, I, I, they've, tra they've changed. Since, you know. I can see change in our school in the yeah. three years that we've been, oh, three right. and a half oh. years. Yeah. So that fast as well. Yeah. Mm. The, the more traditional teachers are moving on, 
bringing in the newer teachers, mm. the younger teachers with yeah. more, uh, you know, methods and just their personalities are different. Children can, can approach mm -hmm. them and they're just nicer mm -hmm. to be around than compared mm -hmm. to some of the more traditional teachers that we have had. Okay, we'll take one more question and then we'll be around after. But yeah, we'll go with this one. Sorry. Um, yeah, I just sort of wondered about, I mean, we've talked a lot about the academic side, but what about, you know, the environment, sports and mm -hmm. arts as well? How does that come into the local schools? So in um, Olive's weekly panel, I was looking at her diary this morning, actually, and she has music, PE and art as part of the curriculum. Um, you know, it might be slightly different than um, you know in a Western school, but you know they do get that sort of exposure. Yeah, uh, totally agree. The the the, the, yeah. the waiting is probably less, but they're not kind of cut off from non-academic uh, subjects. I think it depends on the school. I mean, my my kid's school has a one child one instrument policy, um, and uh, they also they have dance module along with like regular um, PE. They have. Uh, like strange modules from time to time, like fencing module, or uh, anyway, these these things just keep coming up, and I learn about them by accident. And uh, but there's there's a lot going on there. I could do with less of the melodica, if I'm honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the hand chimes. And oh yeah, the hand chimes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, soccer, and there's all kinds of things going on. Your kids' school sounds lovely. <laughs> um, I, I think it's pretty good. There's, I have my complaints, mind you, but uh, I think they've, they've done all right. Okay, well, thank you, each of you, for giving up your evening to come and share your experience with us. We're very much appreciative, and I know the parents are as well. Um, if I ask Ruth to... <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, 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 I'm thanking them. So uh, we've got a small token Thank of our you. appreciation okay. for each Can of you. Yeah. <laughs> it's a really great resource actually, I'm just yeah. joking aside, yes. um, because there are so many parents and parents who are considering local schools, it's very open, it's very supportive, there's no nastiness going on, it's really, mm. it's a nice group yes. isn't it? Yeah. And um, I have your, if you register through the um, online system, I have your email address and we have a little um, um, like 101 of, of local schools which I'll send to, to all of you tomorrow, so thank you very much for coming, thank you. Thank you.
a Catholic girls school in Connecticut to Hong Kong and my parents wished for me to continue with the single sex education and because of the local systems that have worked previously they wanted me to take advantage of the local system here in Hong Kong. The aim was that I would learn Cantonese as well as be able to learn, the, learn about the culture and embrace the culture. My parents considered that the international schools did not provide the open option to integrate into the, to, into the society as much. As I am the eldest of six kids with no school funding, financial reasons for choosing local schools was significant as it is much, much, much cheaper. Um, when we arrived, my parents got local tutors to help with Cantonese and Fuzhenghua whilst we were arranging, whilst we were arranging school places. At first, my siblings and I were accepted into the initiation program of the EDB, which is a government orientation scheme. And um, direct quote from the website is that um, the full-time initiation program is an integrated program provided as an alternative mode of support services for the children just arriving to Hong Kong. So really, it's the EDB helping with um, families who have just moved here and may need to quickly get into school. Um, my siblings, um, two of them, I believe, um, completed nine months of the six-month program. Not completed nine months of the six-month program, yeah. So they joined in the middle of one of them, and then we started with the next one. Um, my initiation program was at Delia Memorial School in Quantong. It was a very, very local school with many um, diverse nationalities, and uh, it was a mixed gender school. And uh, I was to stay there for six months before I would complete the course. In the early weeks of attending the school, I, um, I went to different interviews at uh, Good Hope School, I'm sure most of you have heard of that school, Marymount School, and St. Margaret School. Uh, the Sacred Heart Kenosian wouldn't even interview me, and Good Hope rejected me, and so did Marymount. These are band one type schools and are highly academic and have an uh, emphasis on examination and academic success. Uh, St. Margaret's is a band to a local girls school. It used to be on Kane Road in Mid-Levels, which is not so far from here. So I found, suitable, uh, I found a suitable school in a great location in a good neighborhood. My parents liked that it was Catholic and girls only. I liked that it was easy, access, uh, it was, um, easy to um, access and I could walk to the shops after school and get the bus home from school. I attended St. Margaret's for five years, from Form 1 from, to Form 6. The school had approximately 400 girls. Uh, being in the local school was challenging as the teaching methods are predominantly lecture-based and although interactive, do not have the informality and the experiential learning methods that international schools use. The children are elect, uh, expected to do a lot of self-study as well as um, uh, the quality of the teaching can vary. We had some good teachers and we had some not so, so good teachers. Some teachers are interesting and inspirational, but some are very strict and rigid. I was offered extra support at times and I could have made use of the availability of teachers. Um, the facilities there were not as elaborate as some international schools and we took gym classes at the Sai, uh, Sun Yat Sun Sports Center um, uh, by walking across Bonham Road and through campus, I mean, um, My time at St. Margaret's allowed me to have great exposure to local culture, local politics, and local current affairs. I did not learn Cantonese, uh, I, I learned basic Cantonese, um, and my um, Chinese characters were not great. I couldn't write at all. Um, I found this the most challenging. Um, the medium instruction of my school that I went to is English, and um, many of the students were very good English speakers. And although I was um, the only native English speaker in um, the entire school, pop, uh, entire school, um, I still, I still, I feel like I managed to um, over, I overcame those challenges. Um, uh, as I was saying, there's a huge mix of nationalities, and their native language varied. Some were from the Philippines, Pakistan, Nepal, and it really exposed. Uh, it helped me. Um, really understand the culture uh, of um, their different, their lives. So really going to that school really um, has made me a more open person. Um, I, I'm much more understanding. I'm not narrow-minded. I think outside the box. 
really. Um, uh, my parents wanted me to experience this diversity and not to be in a school with highly privileged children as I had been prior to coming to Hong Kong. The students in my previous school had been from families of extreme wealth and some with bodyguards. <laughs> my parents wanted me to experience a different side of society and considered that, the, that learning Chinese and Cantonese would make up for the lack of advantages <coughs> that the children in international school are exposed to. I took my HKDSEs last year, and I started um, at Hong Kong Academy in Saikong uh, last October, and I am studying the IB um, diploma program in the final year <coughs> present. So um, once I, I more um, to understand that, at the beginning of Form 6, which is the last secondary year in the whole secondary school system, I decided I wanted to do IB because I felt that my DSEs really, um, I couldn't go overseas, I couldn't go in, uh, to college. I mean, I could, but it'd be so much, uh, it'd be much more difficult doing so. So my parents decided to put me into, into international school on my last year at school. So I, um, I guess you could say I repeated because IB is a two-year program. Um, for the future, I, um, I want to apply to acting school, but um, as, it is a, as it's a far-reach profession, the majority of the colleges that I am applying for are politics and international relations. Um, and um, this, uh, that choice really has come from being in a local school with people, um, in, with a school that is so, so diverse. Like, um, I, you won't get that in international school. I mean, you could, but um, it's not as, Um, yeah, uh, my work travel since I was my world travel since I was born have allowed me to have significant awareness of the diversity in the different world nations, and that is what I'm attracted to. The, the liberal studies subject in the local school curriculum has allowed me to have the knowledge of both local politics and global 